the third dream and nightmare I think is the most alarming one. You might think, how can things get more worrying? It's our ability to manipulate whole ecosystems. And we can do this by something called a gene drive. And this is not reliant upon CRISPR, but CRISPR makes it so much easier, like all genetic engineering. A gene drive can sweep through a natural population, uncontrolled, altering, for example, mosquitoes. Mosquitoes lead to the death of about half a million people around the world every year, most of them children under five, as the mosquito transmits malaria. So it makes perfect sense on one level to try and think about ways of eradicating malaria or mosquitoes from parts of the world that currently suffer from that disease. Remember, with climate change, it's coming to get different parts of the world as the mosquitoes will spread. So how does it work? Well, as you can see here, if you alter a gene normally in a mosquito, say, mosquito with a genetic manipulated gene is marked green here. Uh, let's say it's now immune to the, uh, the malaria parasite. It can't transmit it. It mates in the next generation, you get one individual or one quarter of the, your population has got that gene. In the next generation, you've got an eighth and the next sixteenth. You can see that is simply going to disappear. Like most mutations, unless there is an advantage, mutation simply disappears. So we can't change genomes simply by fiddling around with a mosquito gene and then releasing a load of malaria resistant mosquitoes and thinking that's going to do anything. They will disappear very, very quickly. The gene drive is very clever. What it does is to include within it the molecular scissors that cut the gene at a particular point and then copy over onto the other chromosome the gene that you're interested in. So you've, the, the malaria resistance gene is now on both chromosomes of the malaria transmitting mosquito that you've altered. What that means is that in the next generation, each of those genes is present in one copy because these are sexually reproducing organisms. But as soon as the zygote is formed and you've got two genes, two chromosomes, it copies over onto the other chromosome and that insect is now homozygous. And as you can see in this little graphic, that means that very rapidly in an exponential form, the gene sweeps through the population. It is driven to saturation. Every organism in the sexually reproducing population now possesses that gene. And this works in the laboratory. It works in large population cages. Now, what, what could go wrong? Why could there be a problem? Well, Kevin Esfeldt is the man who first realised that this would be easily done. The idea had been first developed at the beginning of the century uh, in, in the UK, but Kevin Esfeldt in 2013, he realised that the new CRISPR gene editing techniques would make this really, really easy. And as he told people, he was a student at the time, Initially, he was really excited. He thought, my God, this can, this can get rid of malaria. But then he woke up the next morning and realised that, in fact, this could go horribly wrong. And once you'd released this kind of thing, you'd have no way of recalling it, of getting it back. And that you'd be introducing a self-replicating genetic change into a wild population. So he didn't even tell his supervisor of his idea for a whole month. About a year later, some other researchers who didn't know about the widespread debates that had been taking place about these gene edited uh, mosquitoes and the possibility of creating gene drives, they went ahead and built one in the laboratory in their Drosophila flies. They did it just because they wanted more mutants of a particular kind that a student was studying. And he thought, how can I do this? And he was very clever. He realised I could make something that simply copies itself over. So I've now got lots and lots of my mutant flies that I can study. And he and his supervisor then realised that they had done something rather alarming. And as you can see from the title of the article, they called it a chain reaction. 
Now, a chain reaction is a term that comes from nuclear technology. And a chain reaction is what produced the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the dropping of the atomic bombs in 1945. So this is an astonishingly powerful technique. It could potentially remove disease-causing mosquitoes, but it could also go hor horribly wrong because we wouldn't be able to control it. In 2016, unlike the rather pusillanimous, mealy-mouthed reports that came out about human genome editing, entomologists and geneticists working on insects published this report, which very clearly stated that there was not sufficient evidence at the time, and there still is not, to allow any of these gene drives to be released. They very clearly said that it should not take place. What about those half million deaths? That's the price that our concern for safety is going to be. By not doing anything, we are not going to reduce those half million deaths. So, for example, Target Malaria, which is a, an international consortium, it's kind of a charity, uh, that is trying to reduce the impact of malaria, and one of the things it's doing is looking at gene drives. That is discussing with people in Burkina Faso about the possibility of releasing gene drives in their country where there is a lot of malaria. Now, who should decide that that should take place or not? Now, I'm sure you would agree that the local population should have a say in that. And I can quite understand that local population with a lot of malaria, losing a lot of their children to the disease, would really, really want to get rid of the mosquito. But now you've got a problem. How can you explain the technology to a population which in many villages is illiterate? They don't have a word for gene, for example. Now, Target Malaria being very clever, they're going into the villages and they're using theatre to explain to the population what is going on, what is being proposed. There are still no gene drives going to be released, but they are explaining to the population why this might be a technique they want to use. But there's still a problem because mosquitoes travel everywhere. You can say, yes, the local community should have a veto, that is an ability to stop these releases. But let's say they say, yes, we really want to have a gene drive. They may be deciding not only for their village, but as the mosquitoes spread and the genes spread with them, for the whole region, country, continent, or even planet. And is that right? Now, there are protests taking place inside Burkina Faso. Here's a demonstration in Ouagadougou, which is the capital. So many people are unhappy about this, often because they are suspicious of the motivations. I think it's very clear that all of the scientists involved in here, they are not Dr. Frankenstein. They are not trying to create some clever way of killing people or doing anything terrible. In a way, it's, it's worse than that. They're extremely well-meaning. And yet, it's potential with this technology, as with any technology, that it could go wrong. And to their immense credit, Target Malaria and all of the researchers involved have been continually thinking about ways of making this technology safer. So that if it were ever to be released, and maybe it never will be, that it can be deployed safely. So, to sum up. For the last half century or so, we've seen a massive transformation of science and society. Scientists routinely use genetic engineering in the laboratory. They routinely use CRISPR gene editing. You can see this in culture. You can see it in Jurassic Park. Remember, those dinosaurs were reconstructed from DNA that had been taken from amber, mosquitoes trapped in amber that had bitten the dinosaurs must be said, that won't work. My colleagues here at the University of Manchester have shown that DNA doesn't even survive in amber from the 1960s, never mind from 66 million years ago. But anyway, it makes for a great film. You can see it in novels, so uh, the idea of genetically engineered humans being used to create 
uh, a source of replacement organs in Ishiguro's Never Let Me Go, which is both a novel and a film. DNA is now, well, it's part of our DNA, the phrase is everywhere. Scientists have repeatedly expressed their concerns at the implications of their work, but the public is less involved. Something's happened. We don't see the demonstrations about GM crops, partly because uh, GM food is only given in Europe, and at the moment in the UK, to animals, not to humans. And it's very striking that those key issues raised at the cinema have now become more pressing. And it is even more important that we understand germline editing, gain-of-function studies, and gene drives. They're all too important to be left to the scientists. Because Spider-Man was told, with great power comes great responsibility. And that responsibility shouldn't be with people like me. It needs to be with all of us. We all need to decide about whether, if, where, and when this technology is deployed.